Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Erez Gaganovich is a photographer, a native Tel Aviv, a TEDx speaker, and the human behind the Humans of Israel project which puts a human face on the country and challenges the preconceptions that many people outside of Israel might have. He's also responsible for the Humans of Tel Aviv and the Humans of the Holocaust projects, which we'll also talk about today. He'll be discussing his work with Yair Agmon, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Information Studies at UCLA and a practicing artist. I'm grateful to him for moderating today's conversation. During their conversation, you're welcome to send us your questions using the Q&E box, which your air will ask. We'll also be asking you occasionally for your comments. So please uh, stay tuned and enjoy the next hour. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, you know, for the introduction. And my name is Erez Kaganovic, and I'm speaking to you right now from Tel Aviv. And I'm going to start uh, the presentation. And usually what I do is that I'm trying to, you know, the conversation will be as, you know, engageable as much as I can. And we're going to do it uh, right now, you know, through the webinar. And we're going to have a conversation. And I'm going to ask questions and present you my stories and pictures. And it's going to be interesting. So let's start. Okay. Humans of Israel. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Eres Kaganovic. I was born and raised in Israel. I'm living in Tel Aviv for the past 10 years. I'm a photographer and a storyteller, and I'm the human behind the Humans of Tel Aviv, Humans of Israel, and Humans of the Holocaust Projects that I'm going to elaborate a little bit more as we go through. So why did I even start a project called Humans of Tel Aviv and Humans of Israel? Uh, I, I, I assume that you know, most of you have ever heard you know, about Humans of New York. And when I saw Humans of New York a few years ago, uh, I realized that this is a beautiful project that I might uh, um, find interest and might, you know, uh, will do a, a spin-off of that, you know, in Israel and Tel Aviv. But before that, I want to explain to you what, what was the idea for creating the Humans of Tel Aviv and Humans of Israel projects. Ever since I was a kid, I was mesmerized by different cultures and different languages. And I remember that I told myself that when I will have enough time and enough money, I would probably hop on the first jet plane and I will go and travel and see the world. And this is exactly what I did. I've been to Europe, I've been to Berlin, I've been to the States several times. I've been to India four times. And usually what is the question that you know, people will ask you when you're traveling around the world? Where are you coming from? And the thing is that most people didn't realize that I'm coming from Israel. And that is probably because of my accent, uh, which I acquired after watching endless episodes of Seinfeld and Friends. And the thing is that, you know, while I was, you know, uh, meeting people all over the world, you know, usually after five minutes uh, of conversation, usually they will ask you, where are you coming from? And when I told them that I'm coming from Israel, you could actually see how their facial expressions started to change. Ah, you're coming from Israel. Isn't it a place where people are actually, you know, getting exploded all the time? Or you coming from Israel, isn't it a place where you actually had perpetual war with your neighbors? And I was really upset, you know, getting all those, uh, all those, you know, uh, misunderstanding about the place I was coming from. And I remember that I told myself that if I had that ability back then to actually take those people back with me to Israel, so I can actually, you know, they could actually, you know, see in their own eyes what Israel and what Tel Aviv is all about, I don't know, maybe, just maybe I would be able to change those misconceptions. And so far, what I did, you know, with Humans of Tel Aviv and Humans of Israel, I've captured more than 2,000 life stories of different Israelis uh, in Tel Aviv and across Israel. And I want to, and what, what I'm actually trying to do is to show the diversity and the multiculturalism and the vibrant civil society that we have in Israel and in Tel Aviv. And usually what I say about, you know, Tel Aviv, living in Tel Aviv, the great thing is that if you will walk, you know, from the south part of Jaffa, uh, the old part, and you will go north, it probably take you, let's say, around, uh, around uh, uh, an hour and a half. But every 10 minutes, uh, there will be different vibe and different languages and different scenery. And this is what makes Tel Aviv such an, an important and such a multicultural city. 
So that was the reason why I decided to, you know, to create the Humans of Tel Aviv, Humans of Israel, and later on, uh, Humans of the Holocaust. Uh, and the thing is that, you know, basically people don't get like three basic things I realize about Israel. The first thing is that Israel is still a functioning democracy. And I know there's a lot of uh, commotion and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot going on right now in Israel, uh, you know, concerning democracy. And with all the, with all the, the, the events that actually happened in the last three months in Israel. And I've got to tell you that I went to a lot of demonstrations and it's something that, you know, you feel that. It's not an academic uh, debate, but still I say that and, and I feel, and I think that, you know, the fact that we have so many Israelis who are actually, you know, going to the streets and protesting and actually, you know, trying to, to make a statement about what they feel about how this country should be. I think this is a great and amazing uh, attribute of, of democracy. Now, the thing is that, you know, people don't realize that Israel is still a functioning democracy. And the thing is that, you know, um, it's pretty amazing because, you know, Israel, uh, when you think about it, there's not a lot of, a lot of democracies uh, in the world that never relinquish their democracy, not even for a single day. Now, you can probably think about the United States and Canada and Britain and probably Australia and New Zealand. But the thing is that, you know, they never had those countries, you know, never had to face the same existential security threats that Israel is facing, you know, from day one. So it's pretty impressive that, you know, Israel is still a functioning democracy. Now, I've got to tell you, you know, one of the most um, in the past, I had the privilege of working as, an, uh, as a parliamentary advisor at the, at the Knesset, at the Israeli parliament. And one of the most moving sessions that I remember in parliament was a session in the education committee. And the title of that session was, how can we make a safer environment in schools for transgenders? Now, everybody was crying and everybody was, it was, you know, people were like really touched and it was really moving. And this is something that you will probably will never hear in the parliaments in Cairo or in the parliaments in, in, in Beirut or in Damascus, or in Amman, or in Baghdad, or in Tehran, for that matter. So there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of openness in the Israeli society for the LGBTQ community. Now, Yair, do you recognize this person or what is actually holding? I believe that is the uh, famous inventor of the, what we Israelis refer to as disk on key, or USB <laughs> flash drive, um, but I'm blanking on his name, to be honest. Um, his name is Dov Moran, and Dov Moran. the story behind Dov Moran is that, you know, in 1999, you know, he had this huge presentation in front of this, you know, in New York, in front of this, you know, 200 Wall Street bankers, and, you know, he came with his computer, with his laptop, and his computer crashed. And he was looking at the computer and the computer was staring back at him and he had no presentation to show. And he was so angry and so upset that something like that really happened to him. Now, you've got to remember, I don't know what is the age of the audience that's actually, you know, watching us. But back then, you know, like in, the, in, in 1999, you know, almost 20, 20 years ago, um, you didn't have the ability or the capacity to actually send big files, you know, through the Internet. So if your computer crashed, it means that you don't have any ability to show your presentation. And he was really angry and really upset. And he told himself that this is going to be the last time that something like this will ever happen to him. And it took him about two years or maybe three years until he managed to create the flash drive. Now, as Israelis, you know, where while we are traveling around the world, we believe and we think that, you know, every person around the world knows that Israel is the startup nation. Now, the thing is that, you know, it's uh, in a way, there's a lot of uh, in innovation that is actually coming from Israel. And usually, you know, you can speak about, you know, when you're eating your salad and you have your cherry tomatoes was created in Israel. When you're getting into your car and you're using Waze as a navigation app actually was created in Israel. Uh, if you ever tried, you know, building a, a website, uh, you probably uh, used Wix.com. So there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of creativity, but this is not what I want to show, you know, about Israel. I wanted to show the diversity, the multiculturalism, and the vibrancy of a society that we have here, 
because I think it's fascinating. And I think that when you hear the human stories of the people who are actually living here, you understand the complexity of living in a place like this. Now, back then, as I told you, you know, I couldn't bring all those people back with me to Israel. But luckily enough, you know, this guy, you know, came along uh, almost 15 years ago and he created Facebook. And there was this huge explosion of social media. Now, I know there's a lot of criticism right now about Zuckerberg and about Facebook and about things that are actually, you know, going on in social media. But because of, of, of social media, you suddenly, you know, had the ability to actually, you know, to take a picture and to upload a story. And if that picture and that story are interesting, people are actually, you know, going to engage with that. So in the beginning, I've got to tell you, I didn't realize the power of social media and Facebook. But luckily enough, you know, I stumbled upon a, a page called Humans of New York. Geir, are you familiar of Humans of New York? Yeah, of course. Who hasn't? Who hasn't? And uh, what can you tell us about Humans of New York? What do you like about Humans of New York? Well, um, it's just a fun little project where you get to meet people and hear their stories. And there's just something very powerful about um, just understanding what people think of their lives in the everyday sense, just how they go about their business and where they live and their personal histories and backgrounds. So th th that's right. In 2013, I think I stumbled upon Humans of New York, and it was like an eureka moment for me because I realized that if I want to tell the Israeli and Tel Avivian story, this is exactly what I need to do. And I remember that I opened a Google search page and I wrote Humans of Israel, and I was a little bit anxious because I didn't know if somebody else already understood the potential of creating a project like this. And I hit the search button. And when I saw that nobody else opened a project like this, I told myself, well, I'm going to do this. But I promised myself one thing. Under no circumstances, I'm not going to pinkwash, whitewash. I'm going to show I'm, I'm, I'm not the prime minister office. I'm not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm not the Ministry of Tourism. I'm going to show the complexity of living in a place like Israel. And I'm going to show the good parts as well as the not so good parts. And I'm going to let other people connect the dots for themselves. And this is exactly, you know, what, what we heard in the introduction of, of the movie that we, you know, of, of what we saw in the beginning of this webinar. And I think that when you show the complexity of what it is to live in Israel, people are appreciating that. Because it's really easy, you know, to speak about democracy and to speak about human rights when you're like in, in, in LA or in UCLA or if you're in Berkeley or if you're in Norway in Oslo. But it's really, really hard when you're living in Israel and day to day, you actually, you know, I always say that, you know, living in Israel and living in Tel Aviv, it's like living in a laboratory for democracy. And it's really, really challenging and it's, it's complicated. But I realized that when you show the complexity, people appreciate that and people are actually, you know, uh, have a better understanding of, uh, of the place that you're actually, you know, living in. There is someone from our audience wants to know if this is an actual photo or it was, was it photoshopped together? So a little bit, you know, background about how I actually, you know, take pictures in the process. So usually what I do, you know, in humans of Tel Aviv is that I walk in the streets and I stumble upon and I engage, you know, total strangers and I start to have a conversation. And this lady, her name is Yael, and she used to be a war correspondent. And she actually worked at Sky News and she worked at... Uh, at ABC, and she came to the dugout of uh, Saddam Hussein actually five minutes after the Marines actually pulled him off. And when she got pregnant, she realized that every war correspondent actually has a bullet with, with its name on it. And she realized that she can no longer, you know, continue being a war uh, correspondent. And she moved to, uh, to Israel and she actually became a, an anchor in the international uh, news channel in Israel. And when she told me her story, uh, while we were walking in Jaffa port, I saw this picture of explosion. And I thought that this is a nice combination between her story and between the picture behind, because it's actually some kind of a synergy that actually, you know, this is a manifestation of what she just told me. And I think that in a way, it also says something about the circle of life that you're actually living in Israel. Because as we speak right now, there are approximately 
200,000 missiles who are aimed at Israel from, uh, from the Gaza Strip and actually, you know, from, uh, from Hezbollah from uh, South Lebanon. But, you know, still people are trying, you know, to do their best and to live their life and to be happy and to try to have some kind of normality. And you got to realize that in the past 10 years, we had multiple uh, conflicts um, and with the Gaza, Gaza Strip. I still remember, you know, as, as being a, a young, young professional, young adult. In 2006, I was living in Haifa and there was rockets actually falling on my, on my city uh, and back then. So this is something that, you know, as you know, living in Israel, you have to, um, you have to understand that. Now, how do you actually do a project like Humans of Tel Aviv and Humans of Israel? You know, it's much easier said than done. And uh, this is one of the first pictures that I took for this project. And in the beginning, you know, I realized that I have a good picture, but I didn't have a good story because I was a little bit, you know, uh, embarrassed, you know, to reach out to, uh, to this asylum seeker and to ask him questions about what brought him to Israel. And I remember that I came back to, to my house and I saw that I have a good picture. But I realized that I don't have a good story that will go along with it. And then I realized that if I'm going to do this project, I will have to get outside of my comfort zone and I will have to reach out to people. And in the worst case scenario, you know, people will actually, you know, they will say no or, you know, it's, it's OK. You know, and actually I have people are not aware of that, but you actually have 50 percent of actually, you know, getting a yes, because it's either a yes or either a no. And if you come in a humble way, and if you're really trying to get the story of a person, uh, I think that people, you know, from my experience, will open up their hearts and it will start, you know, sharing. So, can first ask, of all, uh, yeah. can I ask a question from the audience? Um, yeah, of course. An audience member was asking with regards to your process, whether you ask each person for permission to both um, take their picture and share their story before you do so. So usually you can actually, you know, you can say that 98, 99, 99% of my pictures are actually, you know, pictures that I spoke with a person and we have this, uh, we have this engagement, but some of the pictures are candid moments. And from my experience as a photojournalist, if you will go to somebody and you will ask him to take his picture, uh, you will lose that code of moment. And in Israel, actually, you can have, if, if you're taking pictures in the public sphere, there is no problem, you know, taking the, taking that picture. So um, I, I would say that probably, you know, most of my pictures are are after I had a conversation uh, with, with that with that specific human. Now, for creating this project, you know, you have to create some kind of an intimacy between you and the person that you're actually speaking with, and you have to make some kind of a connection because people, when people in the bottom line, if people will feel comfortable. And they will look great, you know, on the picture and they will, they will be easygoing and they will share their stories and they will be, uh, it will be much easier to actually, you know, to get, to get the story. Gail, what do you think this lady was working at that time? What was her day job? I'm going to go with an insurance agent. <laughs> but I'm guessing that's not it. But well, I'm guessing you're, you wanted you're me close. to say an aesthetician, but uh, you, I want... you're close. But this lady, this human, actually, you know, her she was working at that time. She was actually um, a cashier at a supermarket, and the title that I got for this picture was "She's got the whole world in her hands," which she actually actually has. So I'm always looking, you know, for something interesting, for some kind of a vibe, some kind of something that will be interesting and something that will be insightful and something cool and something that, you know, if you will walk in the street, you will stop and say, wow, this is like, this is interesting. Uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, in this picture, if you will walk in Rachel Boulevard, uh, let's say around Friday, uh, just before Shabbat enters, there's a good chance you're going to meet uh, Yoav and Fonzie. And the thing is that, you know, when Fonzie had his car accident, uh, Yoav uh, decided to create this amazing and special wheelchair. So Fonzie will be able to actually, you know, to stroll along with him in Russian Boulevard. And this is actually, you know, the stories that I'm actually, you know, looking for. Now, Yayu, what do you think the story behind this one? 
And I've got to tell you that Glory is actually is not is not a politician. He's not running for 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 office. Hmm. So no, maybe kissing for uh, political purposes. Um, I am gonna go with just a classic father and son story. Okay, a father and son. That's that's interesting. Um, do we have people from the audience who want to share their thoughts? on the chat box. Feel free to put it in the Q&A and we'll give it a, a, a few seconds. Not a problem. I actually took this picture in Florentine, in a Florentine neighborhood. It's the south part of Tel Aviv. It's actually where I'm living. And when I saw Gloria and Jonathan, there was so much love, you know, uh, with this couple. And I asked them, you know, to take the picture. And the thing is that, you know, it's, uh, they had such a beautiful, uh, such a beautiful connection and such a beautiful uh, uh, relationship. So I see African refugee who married an Israeli national and had this darling child. Well, Jane, that's, that's interesting. But actually the story behind this one is that Glory is actually uh, the nanny of, of Jonathan. And he's actually the babysitter. And they have such a beautiful connection and such a beautiful, uh, um, beautiful, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of love, you know, going on in this picture. But actually, let's put it like this. What do you do with, you know, 50 shades of gray? I came to the conclusion that in the bottom line, you know, every person has a story to tell. And if you find the right angle, you would be able to actually to open their hearts and people will share their stories. And they will go out of their way, you know, to actually, you know, to um, to to tell their story and to to share their experience and to share something about their lives. Now, I've got to tell you that one of the things that I learned after taking more than two thousand life stories for humans of Tel Aviv and humans of Israel is that you know today it's not enough that you have a good story, and it's not enough that you have a good picture. You need to have some kind of a combination between the picture and the story so they will actually you know, resonate one another. Because today we're bombarded with so much information and we have Facebook and Instagram and, and, and TikTok and Twitter and WhatsApp and the flow of information is, is, is huge. So it's really hard to get the attention of people you know, from all across the world. Now, I would like to ask you, what do you think is the story behind this picture? Now, go wild. Maybe you can uh, describe what is in the photo. And I know it's a cropped image, so maybe you can tell us what was the... Actually, this is a picture that I took in Jaffa and it was in front of the, uh, in front of the store that went you know, through, uh, through uh, 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 there was you know, a, a team of a construction worker over there and they were renovating uh, uh, the store. And when I saw that circular saw, I decided, I asked, uh, I asked this lady to actually hold it. So what do you think the connection? What do you think, what, why she is actually holding that circular saw? So we have a construction worker, that's good. Usually people will say that, you know, construction worker, or maybe this could be, you know, for empowerment uh, uh, of women. And maybe she's modeling, you know, for, for, uh, for, for, um, for, um, for um, this circular saw. But the story that goes, you know, uh, for this story, the story was actually about circumcision. <laughs> I can see you, I can see your face. You're like uh, feeling a little bit uncomfortable, you know, when, when, when you heard about circumcision. And the idea is that, you know, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but by the way, this picture went viral. And the thing is that, you know, uh, in Israel, 40 years ago, nobody will even, you know, think twice about performing or not performing circumcision to their newborn. But actually in the last 10 years, uh, mainly in the center of Tel Aviv, and maybe you can say in Paldes Chana Kalku, which is actually a, um, a small city and more between a village and a city, you know, in the north of Israel, um, you have parents who are actually, you know, rethinking uh, uh, if to do or not to do circumcision uh, to their newborns. 
And this picture went viral because I actually, you know, um, I touched a taboo subject that we're, that is, is a taboo subject in Israeli society. And it went viral and it was really interesting and really fascinating. And I asked this lady, uh, which her name is Netta, uh, she's a journalist, and she told me that uh, a, a month be before we actually met on the street, uh, she, published, um, she published an article about the changing mindsets of Israelis uh, about circumcision. And when I saw that circular saw, I said, well, this is really interesting. And I asked her to hold that circular saw. And the thing is that, you know, I could, took, I could have take her picture, you know, only a headshot or without the circular saw. And I can tell you that you wouldn't get the same reaction or wouldn't get the same, uh, 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 same emotion. So I'm there's, always trying to have, yeah. There's a question in the audience. That it's actually a question I had uh, looking at your work as well. And it's about the way you choose to present it online or here in the talk. And how do you, do you always use captions? Um, how do you title your photos? Uh, ah, so do, usually do what you I do is that share... you know, every, every time I'm uploading a story, you know, to social media, it could be, you know, Instagram, it could be on Facebook, uh, Twitter sometimes. The idea is you to take a picture and I always take, you know, uh, let's say between, you know, a paragraph to two paragraphs that actually, you know, giving the, the story, uh, the, the jits, the essence of the story of that person. And I've got to tell you that, you know, in the last, you know, few years, people don't have the patience to actually, you know, to read long texts. So, <laughs> sorry. So I give, you know, uh, around, let's say around 400 words. And if somebody wants to read the full story, I give them the link, you know, in that, in that post to, get, to go to, to my website and they have the ability to actually, you know, to read more and to be better informed and to be better educated. And the thing is that I'm always trying to have this, you know, interesting combination. In this picture, you can see Miri, and Miri, she's actually, she's a modern, modern Orthodox. And she told me that while she was moving to Tel Aviv, it was really hard for her, you know, to be in the Hebrew city and actually, you know, to, uh, to live a, a, a Jewish life because you don't really feel Shabbat when you're living in Tel Aviv. And it's really hard to find a, a kosher, a good kosher rest, restaurant in Tel Aviv. And when she told me about her difficulties and about her challenges, and I saw that poster of that model, Bari Faeli, in the background, uh, and I saw the colors, and I saw, you know, the, uh, uh, the conflict that you actually have between the modern Orthodox world and between the secular world, I said, this is an interesting combination. And I asked her to actually, you know, to pose uh, near, that, uh, near that bus stop. Now, this is an interesting one. Usually what I'm trying to do in my pictures and stories is, as I mentioned before, to try to have some kind of a synergy between the picture and the story. And yeah, how would you uh, translate this graffiti? Um, so for those of you who don't speak Hebrew, in Hebrew it says, I'll say the Hebrew phrase, Imish Kachach Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim Tel Aviv. And it plays off of, a, so I would translate it, if I'll forget Jerusalem, it's because of Tel Aviv. And as a native born Jerusalemite, I can sort of say, it's a very common sentiment. And it plays off of a sentence, a very famous phrase, and if I forget Jerusalem, I will lose my right hand, right? Um, exactly, exactly. And when I met, uh, and when I have this encounter, and actually, you know, uh, Dror actually, you know, told me, and uh, he, he was actually, he, he was born in, in Bnei Brak, which is a big ultra-Orthodox city in the center of Israel. And he told me that, you know, about the fact that he decided to become secular, and he told me about his history. And when he actually came to Tel Aviv, he felt, you know, his first expression was, oh my God, what is actually going on in, in, in Tel Aviv? You know, and, and the distance between Bnei Brak and Tel Aviv is about, let's say, seven kilometers, eight kilometers. It's, it's nothing. And he told me that, you know, when he saw Tel Aviv for the first time, when he was like 14, 15, it really changed his mindsets and he decided to, uh, uh, to become secular and to leave the ultra-Orthodox world. 
And when I heard about his story, uh, I asked him to come with his tefillin and to take his picture, you know, with that graffiti, because the combination, it's, it's interesting. And it makes you something that, you know, it makes you think, makes you, uh, it makes you want to engage, you know, with that, with that picture and that story. So I'm always trying, you know, to use something that the background will be interesting and, and you know, sometimes, you know, artifacts or books. And sometimes it could also be a number. And in this picture, you can see the arms of Yosef Diamond grandkids uh, who decided to commemorate his memory by tattooing his Auschwitz number on their wrists. And you can see there's a tiny diamond over here. And the diamond is because their last name is actually Diamond. And in German, Diamond is actually Diamond. <clears throat> and I published this picture on the International Memorial Day of the Holocaust. And this picture went viral. And I got a lot of messages you know, from people who actually told me that they asked me, why are those young people actually tattooed a barcode on their wrist? And I was really amazed you know, hearing those, those comments. And I got a lot of messages and there was a lot of discussion and this picture and story went viral. And the thing is that, you know, I got a lot of messages from the Arab and Muslim world from people who told me, listen, this is the first time we ever heard about the Holocaust. And this is the first time we actually realized why the state of Israel was even established. And I was really moved. And I was really, I was really proud that I had the ability, you know, to actually to better inform and to better educate people about, about the Holocaust, about Jewish history, about Auschwitz. And that was really, really fascinating. And I've got to tell you that, you know, in the beginning, I, I told you about the project that I'm doing called Humans of the Holocaust. And back then when I published this picture, I never ever thought that I would do a project that will deal with the Holocaust. But then in 2019, I stumbled upon a survey that was uh, published by the Claims Conference, which actually said that 66% of young millennials in the States never heard about Auschwitz, and that 50% of those young millennials do not even name one concentration camp or a ghetto. Now, those numbers, you know, send a shiver down my spine, and I was really, really disappointed that I didn't really understand how come People are not aware of this uh, uh, historical, huge historical event uh, that actually happened only 80 years ago. And that was only one part of the problem. The other part of the equation was the fact that there was actually you know, a rise in anti-Semitism all around the world and also, in, uh, also in, in, in the United States, as the recent ADL uh, report just, uh, just stated. And this is a little combination because on one hand, you have this ignorance about the Holocaust. And on the other hand, you have this rise in anti-Semitism. And this is a little combination because if you're not aware of the consequences of being anti-Semitic, uh, you're not aware what are the dangers and to which places we, we, might, we, might, we might go. And as I thought about this, you know, in the beginning, I was really angry about those young millennials. But as I thought about it, I realized that when I was their age, I didn't want to have any connection to the Holocaust whatsoever. Now, you got to realize my background. I'm Jewish. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. I grew up in Israel, which actually means that I was, you know, I'm, I was hammered with Holocaust education from elementary school. But still, I didn't want to have any connection to the Holocaust whatsoever. And I remember that I told myself that if with all of my background, I didn't want to have any connection to the Holocaust, why would, let's say, you know, somebody from Lexington, Kentucky would want to engage with that? And then I realized that we have to tell the story of Holocaust survivors in a different way. It has to be, in my eyes, more optimistic. It has to be full of life. It has to be colorful. Uh, we, sh we have to, you know, we have to speak about the atrocities. And we have to, uh, to tell the story of, of, of what happened in the Holocaust. But... In my eyes, if we want to engage the young generation, we have to spark a great spark of curiosity at the viewers. So that was the reason why I actually created the Humans of the Holocaust Project. And today, uh, actually yesterday, we mentioned and uh, we commemorated Yom HaShoah at the Israeli uh, Memorial Day of the Holocaust. And today I had the privilege of presenting my Humans of the Holocaust Project 
uh, at the German embassy uh, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, which was really, really moving and really emotional. And uh, the fact that, you know, five Holocaust survivors actually came to the exhibition, to the opening of the exhibition, and, and they were in the German embassy, uh, that was really, really meaningful. Really, really me meaningful. And it was, uh, it, it was amazing in my eyes. So I started the Humans of the Holocaust Project. And just to give you a little bit of an example, uh, it's about the fact that I think that the story has to be global and it has to be optimistic, and it has to be uh, full of life. And this is one of the pictures that I took for Humans of the Holocaust. And in this picture, you can see Dougal Leitner. And Dougal Leitner is a Holocaust survivor from, uh, from Auschwitz. And the first thing that Dougal actually told me was that the only thing that actually kept him going while he was in the Holocaust was his sense of humor. So we both realized that we have to tell his story in a different way. And we come up with the idea that you know Duga will actually uh, will 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 actually take this, this this picture you know with a balloon in the shape of the notorious uh, uh, yellow badge. But the thing is that you know uh, Duga is not only holding the balloon; is actually you know embracing it, and he actually reclaiming you know that symbol, and he turning it upside down on its head, and he's optimistic, and he's full of life. And he's happy and he's a proud Jew. And he, you know, he's actually, you know, he survived the Holocaust. And what I do, you know, in my project in, 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 in the humans of the Holocaust is that, you know, I'm, I'm having the story the, the, uh, of the Holocaust survivors of Dougal. And he speaks about, you know, uh, what happened to him. And he speaks about the atrocities. And he speaks about all the, all the things that happened to him in Auschwitz. But the thing is that, that, that we're not highlighting, you know, only, only the atrocities. He also speaks about, you know, his, his, his optimism. And he always says that, you know, his message is that if he managed to actually to survive the Holocaust and to survive Auschwitz, it's because of his optimism and it's because of his resilience. And if he actually, you know, managed, you know, to survive the Holocaust, you know, every person around the world, no matter what is actually, you know, going on right now in your life, if you will be optimistic and if you will be full of life, you will be able to find the resilience inside of you to actually to overcome that. And this is a global message. This is something that people can engage with. And this is something that people can actually relate to. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, in every picture and every story of the humans of the Holocaust, I always share links you know, for, you know, for actually, you know, to get the context and to get, you know, to, to get the information, you know, it could be from, uh, uh, from, you know, uh, from Holocaust museums from all around the world. It could be, you know, uh, the New York Times. It could be something that will give them the context. And what I'm trying to do in units of the Holocaust is actually to bring people into the table because we have, we are living in a generation that we have to create interesting content in order to people that to get their attention and actually to uh, uh, to actually to get them to get them engaged, and this is exactly what I'm trying to do in Humans of the Holocaust, and I'm trying to better inform and to better educate people about about the Holocaust. And I can tell you that you know, hopefully, uh, in November I will present the Humans of the Holocaust exhibition in Dubai, and hopefully I will be able to present Humans of the Holocaust next year. In, uh, in the UN headquarters or in Geneva or Geneva or, or in New York. Now, Yair, I would like to ask you, what do you think about this picture? What was your first reaction? Um, first, let me ask you, there was a question from the audience if uh, yep. he is in Israel. Ah, is, uh, is, is Dugo is, is, is Dugo Dugo in Israel? Yes. In Israel. Yeah. Dugo is living in Israel. He's living in near Ashdod in uh, near Galim. And maybe you're familiar with Dugo Leitner because every year there's a, an operation called during uh, Yom HaShoah uh, called, uh, uh, actually, it's actually, sorry, it's actually during January 18. And it's around the International Memorial Day of the, of the Holocaust when Auschwitz was liberated. And it's called uh, Dugo, uh, Operation Dugo. And because when Dugo was actually, you know, released uh, from Auschwitz, he ate uh, meatballs. And when he saw that meatballs, when he came to Israel, those meatballs was actually a little bit 
look like falafel balls. So every year on that date, on the 18th of January, when he was liberated from Auschwitz, uh, he eat pita, you know, with falafel. And people from all around the world are actually, you know, eating pita with falafel and they're uploading their stories and uploading their pictures. I see there's a, there's a question about any photos of Palestinians, whether citizens of Israel or works from the territories. Uh, well, there's a few pictures and stories of the, of the, of, it depends how you, how they want to be described, you know, Arab Israelis, Palestinian Israelis, and I share a couple of stories of the Palestinian Israelis and, you know, to show their, their, uh, the complexity of living in a place like Israel. It's, 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 it's very, very complicated. Uh, to be an Arab Israeli or a Palestinian Israeli, it depends how you want to, 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 to describe and to use that term. And yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I think it's, I think it's important. And I think it's, it's something that, you know, we, 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 need, we need to engage with and we need to discuss. And by the way, in Humans of the Holocaust, one of the uh, Holocaust survivors that I took their picture, uh, her name is uh, uh, Laila Jabarin, but she was born in the name of uh, Yelena Bryshetsky. And she managed to survive the Holocaust. And in the age of 15, she met Muhammad. And it was puppy love and they decided to, uh, to get married. And she's living today in Um el Fahim, which is a big Arab city in the north of Israel. And she spoke about, she wanted to, to tell her story because she thought that when she was a kid, people were trying to kill her because she was Jewish. And today there are people who would like to kill her because she's a Muslim. And she spoke about what happened in the Tree of Life synagogue, the massacre, the mass shooting that happened in Pittsburgh a few years ago. And then she spoke about what happened in Christchurch in New Zealand, the massacre that happened over there a few years ago in the big mosques uh, in, in Christchurch. And she said there's a thin line, you know, connecting between what happened in Pittsburgh and what actually happened in Christchurch. And that is blind hatred for minorities. And she says that in the bottom line, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, it doesn't matter if you're Muslim, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian, in the bottom line, you know, we could all live together. Now, yeah, well, what do you see uh, about this picture? Oh, um, maybe later we can get back to, uh, some people are asking to see if there's, uh, see the photos of Palestinians. Um, what I think of this picture, um, I don't know. I think his expression is, uh, uh, it's great to see his expression and his joy and taking ownership of something that he has experienced as incredibly oppressive uh, and given the opportunity through photography to maybe reclaim some of that narrative. So in that sense, I very much appreciate you giving him that opportunity. And in my eyes, you know, the fact that he's actually, you know, reclaiming, you know, that symbol and turning it upside down on its head and he's actually proud. So, uh, Dougal Leitner is an amazing person. Now, I want to share with you what are the things that I learned about Israel along the way. And this is after, you know, taking more than 2,000 life stories uh, for humans of Tel Aviv and humans of Israel. And, you know, they say that actually, you know, Tel Aviv and they say that actually, you know, Israel. Uh, we're situated in a very, very tough neighborhood. And actually, you know, they say that, you know, Tel Aviv has its own mean urban jungle, but nothing in the world could actually, you know, prepare me for this. Now, you've got to realize this is not Purim, this is not Halloween, this is an ordinary day where an ordinary guy, you know, decided to take his lion for a walk in Rachel Boulevard. And I remember that, you know, back then my girlfriend was like, Egez, you got to wake up. There's a lion walking in the street. And I was like, ah, no, nah, I don't think so. You know, wake me up if the Easter bunny will come early this year, which he actually did. So once again, this is not Purim. This is not Halloween. It's an ordinary day in Israel. And we do have our own share of monkey business, you know, going on in, in Rothschild Boulevard. And... It's really, really interesting, and it's really, really fascinating, you know, to see uh, uh, all of this uh, urban jungle. And usually, you know, people will ask me, okay, Eres, after taking so many pictures and so many stories, if you need to choose only one picture 
that will actually tell the DNA that you have in, in Tel Aviv for that matter, I would usually say that I will choose this picture because in this picture, you can see there's a freedom of religion and freedom of religion. And this is one of the greatest things that I love about Tel Aviv. And I remember that I published this picture, I think it was almost eight years ago. And during that time, there was a lot of uh, terrorist attacks in France. I don't know, uh, you probably remember the Chalvi Abdo and the, uh, the, and the kosher supermarket attack in Paris. And during that time, the French government decided to have this ban uh, on, on burkini, which is a special swimsuit that Muslim ladies are actually wearing when they're going to, uh, going to the beach or to the swimming pool. And I remember that, you know, I was thinking about it and I told myself, how come, <clears throat> sorry, we're speaking about France. France is the cradle of modern democracy. And they actually decided to have this ban about burkini. And let's go back to Israel. In the past 75 years, you know, since the first day of the establishment of, of the state of Israel, we suffered for almost, you know, uh, existential security threats, uh, and multiple wars, uh, multiple terrorist attacks, and we never even thought about banning a uh, niqab, hijab, uh, burkini, uh, you know, any other outfit out there. So I think it's it's something to say about the openness and the freedom of religion and freedom from religion that we actually have in Israel and we have in Tel Aviv. And this is one of the pictures that I really, really love, you know, from humans of Tel Aviv and humans of Israel, because it actually tells the story that we actually have in Tel Aviv in a way that we actually, you know, it's uh, sometimes it could be clashes of cultures, but it actually tells the story that, you know, in Tel Aviv, you can walk the way that you would like to walk and nobody will make a fuss about it. And if you are seeing something in the street that you don't like, you know, you can just turn your head to the other side of the road and, you know, just keep going. Now, I've got to tell you, you don't have to be this amazing photographer to actually take this picture. And you just need to know your surroundings. And this was August. And it was almost, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Israel. But if you're coming to Israel and Tel Aviv, you know, in August, it means that it's almost, you know, 35 Celsius degrees. I don't know how much it is in Fahrenheit. And the humidity is almost 95% and you're sweating. You, you're standing in the street and you're literally sweating. So I realized that, okay, this is Friday. Probably people will go to the beach. And I knew that, you know, down that road, there's actually a big synagogue of ultra-Orthodox uh, community. And I just waited to see if something interesting will, will actually happen. And when I saw that young ultra-Orthodox guy, you know, moving to my direction, and I saw those young ladies, I just waited that they would be on the same line, and I actually took this picture. And I've got to tell you that, you know, during my presentations, you know, in the States, uh, I was, you know, I, I gave some, I gave a, a, a conversation to a school, I think it was in the Midwest, I think it was Ohio, and one of the kids actually stood up and asked me, what is Abraham Lincoln actually doing in Tel Aviv? And this is the great thing, you know, about photography. And this is the great thing about, about art is that every person have their own connotation. And it doesn't matter, you know, uh, you can live in Israel and see this picture and have your own connotation. And you can be in Ohio, in the Midwest and, and, and have different connotations. And this is the great thing about art and about photography. So as I mentioned, you know, I always try to make something interesting, something relevant. Uh, in this picture, you can see Gidon Lev, and Gidon is a Holocaust survivor. And by the way, uh, just open your, your cell phones and try to Google Gidon Lev, and probably it will take you, you know, to his TikTok page, which has more than half a million uh, followers uh, from all around the world. And when he told me about his story and about the fact that he was himself a refugee, I asked him to come to my neighborhood and in Florentine, and we, I saw this graffiti, we were all once refugees. And in the background, I don't know if you can actually see that, you have pictures in black and white who are actually pictures of, uh, of, of, of Jews who came to Ellis Island on the, uh, in the 19th century. And I thought this is something that will be interesting and something that you know 
it will be it will be interesting to to place Gidon in the in that background. So I can tell you that you know in the bottom line from what I, I actually you know learned after taking more than two thousand pictures and stories is that you know it doesn't matter if you're Jewish and it doesn't matter if you're Muslim and it doesn't matter if you're a Christian. In the bottom line, you know this is the equation that we should all learn from. And we should learn that, you know, in Hebrew, you have a saying, you should love your brother, you should love your neighbor uh, the way that you love yourself. And I realized that, you know, after interviewing more than 2,000 different Israelis, is that we need to actually, you know, to, to listen. And we need to open our hearts and we need to try to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes in order to understand them. And if we will have that ability, and if we will have that compassion, I can tell you that, you know, a lot of things in the world will be able, we will be able to sort it out, even, even the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, it sounds like science fiction. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, the person that you're actually seeing in this picture, his name is Dr. Danny Gold. And Dr. Danny Gold is the creator of the Iron Dome Missile Defense System. And I took this picture during 2014, uh, and there were sirens, you know, there was one of the conflicts that we had, uh, I think it was Tsukeitan, and it won one of the most major conflicts that we had with the Gaza Strip, and there were rockets flying into Tel Aviv. And I remember that I asked Dr. Gold, can you please tell me what is your two cents about creating uh, this amazing uh, Iron Dome system? And he told me that, you know, in the beginning, you know, most of the people thought he was a lunatic, uh, thought he was crazy because the idea that, you know, one missile will be able to intercept a different missile in midair, it sounds like, you know, when pigs will fly. But he told me that no matter what, if you have a good idea and if you have something that you really believe in, you know, you know, you have to like push the envelope and you have to do everything in your own power to actually, you know, to try to accomplish that. And even though, you know, people thought he was a little bit, you know, like Don Quixote and people thought that, you know, he's like chasing windmills and fighting dragons in the bottom line, you know, he managed to create this amazing system, which actually helps to save a lot of lives, both in Israel and also in the Gaza Strip. And it does sound like science fiction, because if somebody would have told me, you know, almost eight years ago that I will open a project called Humans of Tel Aviv and Humans of Israel and Humans of the Holocaust. And I will be able to better inform and to better educate people from all across the world about Israel and about Tel Aviv and about the Holocaust. I would probably say that it sounds like science fiction, but I can tell you that sometimes even science fiction can become a reality. So thank you so much uh, for uh, joining me and for giving me the ability to speak about my projects. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, uh, to ask. Thank you, Aaron. We have a few more minutes, so if anybody has any questions, then please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them. In the meantime, uh, earlier there was a request to see some of the photos of Palestinians who might live in Tel Aviv or in Israel, and you know, might cross paths with. So I think it would probably, you know, take me a little bit of a while, you know, to get to the specific file because I don't, um, when I'm putting pictures, I'm not putting, I don't have a file of, you know, Palestinians, Israelis, you know, I, I sort the stories by the stories. It's not by their uh, national identity. Mm -hmm. I guess in the meantime, maybe I'll ask you if any, in the, while people are sort of formulating their questions, um, you spoke about multiculturalism and sort of this desire to uh, show Tel Aviv both as, not as a bubble, uh, for the Israeli audiences and sort of diversifying what other people inside Israel think of Tel Aviv, as well as saying something to the world about who are the Israeli people. And we're sort of in this moment, for those of you who don't know, uh, between Yom HaShoah, the Day of Commemoration of the Holocaust in Israel, and the uh, National Remembrance Day for Fallen Soldiers or victim, and Victims of Terrorist Attack, and Independence Day that follows. And it's always this moment, at least for me, that brings to mind this question like who we are, right? Like who we are as a nation, who belongs and who uh, doesn't belong in us and how do we represent or 
uh, kind of think about that. And I was wondering, how does your project fit into that moment, especially uh, when this year uh, uniquely we're in this even more contentious moment where political protests all over Israel are using or sort of speaking in terms of divisions and differences uh, across ethnic, religious, and cultural groups, and you're sort of trying to unify uh, or trying to bring these things together. So I thought maybe if you could offer some uh, thoughts about that, the, the sort of like desire to pull things together and, and sort of these undercurrents that um, are trying to like highlight differences between groups. I think there's a huge polarization, you know, right now in Israel. Uh, you have two major groups, and actually, you know, it's it's it feels that you know uh, it feels that it's really really complicated. And you're well aware, also in the American society, you have a lot of polarization, you know, after you know uh, the Trump administration, and it feels like that people don't want to hear. And I won't get into the details of the reform that you know actually you know what, where uh, the uh, the government is trying to. Uh, actually up, uh, upload, you know, uh, uphold in, 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 in the Knesset. But the thing is that people don't want to hear. And sometimes they feel they are like from both sides. And I feel that people need to pause, you know, for a second. And, you know, you spoke about the, the, the Holocaust Remembrance Day. One of the things that I heard from Holocaust survivors is that, you know, they never even imagined that they're going to be a Jewish state. And their vision and their belief is that, you know, if you have a Jewish state and you have, an, you have Israel, you have to clinch, you know, with your fingers and to do everything in your power to actually to keep that country going. And in the last three, in, in the last three months, uh, there's a feeling that things are starting to break up and the social cohesion and the togetherness that we, we, we had, you know, in, 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 you know, since the establishment of, of the state of Israel, it feels that it was really eroded. And it feels that we have to have some kind of a new social contract. And it's, it's, it's really complicated. And I really, 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 really hope that, you know, uh, the government, you know, will come to our senses. And if they are going to do any kind of reform, they have to do it, you know, by speaking to people and not forcing that reform because democracy is not only the majority, as you're well aware. Democracy is also about human rights. It's also about uh, civil rights. And it's about the fact that, you know, because Israel is such a polarized society, you have to try to bring people together and not to bring people to fight one another. Thank you. All right, there's a couple of last questions before we go. Yep. A comment by uh, Ray Rafidi he says, I'm a Palestinian American. Uh, oh, they say, I'm sorry, I don't mean to uh, assume gender here. I'm a Palestinian American with an interest in photography. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Any plans to put your photographs in a book with your accompanying essays? And there's another question, maybe you can take them together, uh, that it seems that the project is aimed at people outside of Israel and they are wondering what your responses are, what kind of responses you get from within Israeli society. So I can tell you that, you know, I think Israelis, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, the first question about the book, uh, I'm planning to do so. Um, but right now I, I'm putting all of my focus on Humans of the Holocaust Project because I feel like I'm, I'm it's actually, uh, I don't have a lot of time to actually, you know, to capture the stories because Holocaust survivors are in the age of 85 till 90. And if I won't do it, you know, in the in the next, you know, uh, year or two, I won't be able to capture their stories. But definitely I'm planning to have the Humans of Tel Aviv uh, book and Humans of Israel and Humans of the Holocaust. And concerning what Israelis are thinking, uh, some people are, you know, it, 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 it depends, it really depends. Because as I said, you know, I'm not trying to force my own ideas, you know, when I'm actually, you know, posting the stories and the pictures, I'm showing the reality the way it is. And I'm going to let other people connect the dots for themselves. And sometimes, you know, I publish, you know, pictures of asylum seekers who are actually, you know, criticizing Israel. 
or stories of the Palestinian Israelis who are you know criticizing Israel. And I'm saying, you know, I'm 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 only the photographer. I'm not trying to impose my own ideas or my own beliefs. I'm showing the reality the way that I see it. And I'm gonna let other people connect the dots for themselves. And sometimes I had, you know, a few Israelis who criticized me, you know, for doing that. But I told them that, you know, in my eyes, I'm going to show the reality. You like it or you don't like it, you know, it's it's up to you. But I want to show the reality the way that it is. And I think that people should actually, you know, have the ability, you know, to actually to, to engage with that. All right. Thank you very much, Erez. Uh, we're out of time right now, so we'll wrap things up. And again, thank you for uh, coming and joining us on this wonderful presentation and conversation. Uh, you can find Erez Projects on Facebook uh, as you keep going and on other social media. I want to also say thank, say thank you, sorry, for uh, Professor Waxman and the Nazarian Center for holding this conversation. Um, and for more events, you can check out, check out the website for the Nazarian Center um, and uh, attend the other events we have lined up. Um, thank you very much and have a nice day, everyone. Todalaba from Tel Aviv.